Well, folks, just minutes ago, we got more data out that follows up on yesterday's data, which really gives us some more color on the Federal Reserve's a great reset. The Federal Reserve made it very clear, we need to look at the data. And we just got three sets. We got GDP yesterday, we got inflation via the Fed's preferred PCE gauge this morning, as well as the Employment Cost Index. And it's important to set this up appropriately. On one hand, yesterday, stocks plummeted after we got the annualized GDP report. That's because we were expecting an economy that was growing at a modest or moderate pace. We were looking for an annualized GDP read of 1.8% which remember what annualized means when you're calculating GDP. It means you got a read of GDP growth of 0.45% over a three month period. And then you just multiply it by four and you get 1.8%. But we didn't actually grow at 0.45%. If we grew at 0.45% and inflation came down, hey, everything's probably peachy. The economy's still moving along in a modest, positive way. Probably don't need the Fed to keep hiking rates. And inflation seems to be trending down. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, and that's the twisted world we live in right now, we actually got a number that was quite different from this yesterday. And we had some numbers this morning that were also quite different than expected. What did we get? We got point. 6% on the three quarter basis, which gives us growth of 2.4% on GDP. That means the economy is actually growing faster than expected. And a lot of folks are nervous that if the economy is growing faster, the Fed's going to have to do a lot more to rein in inflation. That's because there's a belief, especially amongst the bears, that the hotter the economy operates, the more inflation we are dealing with. But that's also what people thought in China when China went to reopen. They thought that when China went to reopen, we would have this great burst of a second wave of inflation. And back then, I argued, wait a second. China's economy was doing quite well and growing at an average clip of 8%, which would be like 2% per quarter, for like four times our growth rate, for nearly a decade before the pandemic and they were not facing inflation. In fact, if anything, everybody was worried that in the longer term, innovation would drive deflation, which is in fact what Japan is facing so much so that they just had to adjust yield curve controls to essentially stimulate their economy. And so this is where we could look at today's data, which Jerome Powell told us to pay attention to and ask ourselves, okay, is this really a bad thing. Now, one thing that is bad is Enphase's forecast for solar in Q3, even though Q2 beat like crazy, Q2 was fantastic, million dollar buyback, beats all over, beats on EPS, beats on revenue, everything almost beats, uh, or revenue was more roughly in line, but beats at least on EPS and margin. Great numbers, really, for Q2. Q3, complete disaster, though. Makes you wonder, is it a buy the dip? or is something happening to solar demand? And could that tell us something about the strength of the consumer? Who knows? But what we do know is that this morning, we got the Employment Cost Index and PCE. ECI is really important because it could flag a wage price spiral. It's something we've been paying attention to, but it's been that sort of gopher that just never comes up. The Employment Cost Index in the prior read had a read of 1.2%. In this read, we are expecting 1.1%. What we actually got was amazing programs on building your wealth, link down below. That's the sponsor of the video. My programs of building your wealth, join me in the course member live streams where we dive deep into fundamental analysis on real estate stocks, your questions and answers, buy sell signals for whether it's small stocks, large stocks, you name it. Check them out, link down below. So what did we get on the ECI? We got 1% as an actual read, which is great. We actually came in lower than expected. Again, we were looking for a 1.1, prior was 1.2, we got 1.0, fantastic. What about PCE, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge? On a month over month basis, we were expecting 0.2, we got 0.2. 
on a month over month core, we went from a prior of 0.3 to expecting 0.2, we got 0.2. So a very much in line inflation read here. On a year over year figure, we got a 3% handle on the PCE and year over year core, we got 4.1 versus the 4.2 expecting expected and the prior core of 4.6. So this really sets us up for a fascinating environment because on one hand, you're going to have the bears say that the Fed can by no means crush inflation if the economy is growing strong, that those two things are just going to run contra to each other. And unfortunately, if the economy does well, we're just going to need to anticipate more rate hikes. When on the other hand, the Federal Reserve made it clear that they just want to see inflation fall and they're willing to exhibit some patience. That's what Jerome Powell just mentioned in his last presser. Finally, he mentioned they're willing to exhibit some patience. And the reason for that is, even though they really want to get inflation down as quickly as possible while inflation expectations are anchored, they're willing to be somewhat patient so that way we don't end up with a lot of joblessness and layoffs because that creates a lot of human hardship, especially if inflation is trending down and all you have to do is be a little bit patient to see it come to fruition. Of course, everything comes down to what actually caused inflation. We personally believe that it was the rapid acceleration in the rate of money printing that caused inflation, not necessarily money printing in itself. Now, of course, we understand that's different from what the Austrian economists think, who say that anytime you expand the money supply, Kevin, that is inflation. To them, you might have some stress over the next few years as the bull market potentially continues on via the Nike swoosh recovery. And yeah, there'll be some volatility. Yeah, there'll be some buy the dip opportunities. But you can always buy life insurance in as little as five minutes by going to metkevin.com slash life. And you bears, you get Apple or Android pay in as little as five minutes. Check it out at mckevin.com slash life. So what do we have here? The five-year break-even chart showing us that, yes, inflation expectations have popped up a smidgen, nowhere near what they popped up in February where we ran up to about 2.6, 2.7%. We're still stable at about 2.3, but we are up from about that 2.2 level, and we're slowly sneaking up on this. So I'm really watching this level. I'm surprised it did not sneak up more after those GDP numbers yesterday. In addition, or uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, after those GDP numbers yesterday specifically. Uh, in addition to that, we have the expectation for the terminal rate for the Federal Reserve. It did not actually move up after the GDP numbers yesterday and hasn't moved much after the inflation numbers this morning. Now, this is actually really interesting because I would have expected that this number would have popped a bit, but this is a sign that the bond market is actually siding with the bulls in this regard. Now, I know that sounds crazy because of the inverted yield curve, but the bond market is telling us, nope, we don't actually have to price in another rate hike. Nope, we're not really worried about runaway inflation. Now, every bear and their mom has one big tool in their war chest, and it is called the inversion of the 10-2 yield curve. However, we have to be real with this, and this is actually a debate that those on Wall Street regularly have, regularly have. We have to be real and consider that, yes, it is the steepening of the yield curve that's the problem, not just the inversion. The bears agree with this. As the yield curve inverts, well, uh, or sorry, re-steepens, that is, goes from being negative to positive again, we tend to get pain. And... They're, the bears are going to look at yesterday and they're going to say, Kevin, did you see how GDP came in stronger yesterday? Did you see how stocks sold off a lot yesterday? That was just a little bit of re-steepening. Prepare for even worse re-steepening. And this is, I have to hand it to them, the best argument they have. Because take a look at this. This shows you the 10-2 inversion. Anytime we are under the zero, we tend to signal a recession within 18 to 24 months. As you can see, we actually inverted right about when the Federal Reserve started hiking in March of 2022. Now, some of the bulls like to counter argue this and say, well, this is just the bond market pricing in the fact that inflation is likely to plummet. 
After all, if inflation is going to go away, why would you not pick up some of these? Look at this. This is the 30-year treasury, back over 4%. Why would you buy a two-year treasury yielding you, say, 5%, but only for two years, when you could literally lock in essentially guaranteed money from the government at 4% for the next 30 years? This is way different from you buying uh, or putting your money into like a Robinhood where you're gonna get 4% for maybe the next few years. This is getting 4% for the next 30 years every single year. That's a really good deal. Why is that happening though? And what could that have to do with the inversion of the yield curve? Well, right here, this is what the bond market is doing. They are buying the long bonds and they are not buying the short ones. This makes sense. Let me ask you this. Would you rather buy stocks in a volatile environment like potentially now or buy a two-year treasury bond? Well, I think the opportunity cost of a two-year treasury bond is likely a lot higher. You're probably better off buying stocks. Would you now rather buy stocks or guarantee 4% for the next 30 years? A lot of the population, pension funds, hedge funds, uh, retirees, are gonna look at this and go, a base at 4% locked in for the next 30 years is a great deal. Let's get that. In fact, a lot of pension funds only need to return like five to 7%. So if you could create a base of a 4% asset and then throw in some other assets that could maybe potentially get you the rest of the yield that you need, you don't actually have to do that much work. So it makes logical sense to allocate a lot of money to a 4% treasury for 30 years. It's incredible. It's a great way to get the yield that you need. And then you can arrest, invest in other assets that, that you desire to invest in or what other, whatever for the rest of your return. This is why institutions are buying long treasuries and they're not putting as much pressure on the shorter term treasuries. What happens when you do that? Well, folks, when you buy long, anything you buy, you lower the yields on. When you don't buy short, you actually increase by lowering demand, therefore uh, lowering the price, you actually increase the yield of the shorter term stuff. And guess what? That's how you get an inversion. Usually this works in opposite, but this is such, we're in such a unique circumstance where you can buy these really high yielding longer term bonds and the shorter term ones come with more risk it somewhat makes sense that the yield curve is inverted. And any of the latest data that we have shows that, at least based on GDP, we're at least six months away from a recession. And frankly, by then, we might have blown way through the potential of getting into a recession. So buckle up. Things are still going to be volatile. And you can still get 12 free stocks with Weeble by going to metkevin.com slash free. 12 free stocks, pretty cool. This is a paid promotion along with the life insurance I mentioned earlier. And of course, the programs on building your wealth linked down below, which are of course sponsored by me. So what is the big bottom line here? The big bottom line here is GDP is stronger than expected. That's great for earnings. It is great for workers and employees. What else do we have? Inflation continuing to fall along expectations and the employment cost index coming in lower than expected. This says the Fed doesn't have to do more. On top of that, I mean, this is, this is frankly the Goldilocks definition. And the inverted yield curve makes logical sense because of institutional allocation. Now, what's potentially a value play to make out of all of this? Well, look at Intel's earnings. I've allocated quite a bit to Intel over the last eight months, and they just smashed earnings by six, well, they're, they're up about 6% in pre-market. Pay attention to Intel. Read about Intel. Intel, a lot of people look at and say, it's a value trap. I look at it and say, they are investing to be America's greatest chip manufacturer, and they're getting some big old stimulus money from the government. So we wanna pay attention to Intel. And we also wanna pay attention to the solar industry. The solar industry is still going through really what's probably the start of the solar recession. So we'll have to be somewhat careful about the solar industry, 
but there's an argument to be made that once we get back and through all of this madness, solar will be right back to growth. So decide how you want to play these, but these are still two great stocks, Enphase and Intel, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye. Now, I want you to know this, when it comes to AI, time is what's going to make you money. And if you can prove that value to an employer, you'll always be able to be employed. So this is another way of making sure that you don't get replaced.